Hello everyone and welcome back to the Hammered Corner. Today we have a penny from the reign of Henry I, the first of which to grace the channel. This is a specimen that was listed for sale over on the Fortuna Numismatic eBay store, linked below, that I had the pleasure of listing recently. And for those newcomers out there thinking, why does a coin in such poor condition go for such a high sum of money? Well that is what we're going to be discussing in today's video. It is very apparent by now that I love almost every coin spanning the British monarchy, and it is getting harder and harder to get my hands on a coin that I haven't held before. So when this came in I was thrilled, and I have actually reserved it until I can afford to pay it off in the next couple of months. Henry I's reign coincided with a period of monetary crisis. Skepticism concerning the quality of the coinage led to the testing of the coins by the public, hindering their acceptance in circulation. The year 1124 wasn't a good one to be an English moneyer. Things started to go seriously wrong for the men who minted the country's coins when King Henry I, the youngest son of William the Conqueror, found that coins he needed to pay his knights at the end of the campaign in Normandy were of poor quality. So infuriated was Henry by this discovery that he sent orders to England that all moneyers should be punished by losing their right hands and being castrated. His command was carried out by his chief minister, Roger, Bishop of Salisbury, over Christmas that year. Yet not every moneyer, it seems, was subject to this hideous fate. We know this from an entry in the pipe polls, the records of financial transactions collated by the English exchequer for 1130. Brand the moneyer accounts for £20 that he might not be mutilated with the other moneyers. It's the briefest of references to the Moneyers ordeal, but it proves that, for one of their number at least, this episode didn't have the most painful of endings. It is entries such as these that make pipe rolls such a valuable resource. Dating from the early 12th century, they are a record of annual accounts that were collated by sheriffs, the king's principal financial officials in the counties. Each year the sheriffs had to attend a review of these accounts at the Exchequer, which was located in Westminster which took its name from the checked cloth on the table round which the members of the court sat. Counters were then set out on the cloth showing how much the sheriff had paid and how much was still outstanding. The written record of that audit was recorded on rolls, which looked like sections of pipe. So what do pipe rolls tell us about the wealth of Henry I? First of all, they reveal that £24,000 was paid to the treasury as cash, or accounted for as expenditure in 1130. The largest single item came from royal manors, most of which provided a cash payment to the king, as well as yielding produce. The king also had important rights over towns, cities, and the church. When bishops and abbots died, their revenues were paid into the treasury until a successor was appointed. Henry could, of course, also levy taxes, of which the largest in 1130 was the famous Danegeld. But by the 12th century, this was no longer paid as a tribute to the Vikings, but towards the cost of the monarch's knights. Beyond land and taxation, the pipe rolls for 1130 tell us that the king could make plenty of money for, well, simply being king, and there were a number of ways in which he could do so. Justice was one of the king's most lucrative sources of income. If, for example, you were caught hunting Henry I's deer, then, thanks to the forest laws introduced by his father William I, you'd be hit with a hefty fine. And if you needed permission from the king to succeed large estates, to marry an heiress or a widow, the chances are you'd have to pay him for the privilege. Another valuable source of income for the king were the Jews. They had arrived in England after 1066, probably from ruin, and by 1130 there was an important Jewish community in London. The pipe rolls give an insight both into their financial dealings and their vulnerability. The king was notionally the Jews' protector, and the Jewish community could, in theory, enlist his help in collecting money that they were owed. However, the pipe rolls for 1130 reveal that on their account, Jews owed £2,000 for a sick man whom they had killed. This phrase suggests that the Jews were already falling under suspicion of harming others, a dark foreboding of the accusation in King Stephen's reign that they were responsible for the ritual murder of a child in Norwich. So, Let's take a closer look at the specimen itself. This is a coin of BMC 15, a quadrilateral on cross flurry type. As for the quality of the coin, this was no exception to the crude style and lack of care in the manufacturing process. The obverse displays crowned king holding scepter, 
on a very uneven and square-like flan, with no coin legend visible around the outside. The reverse displays a quadrilateral with Liz on each apex over a cross flurry, with only a few visible letters present that would have given us the name of the money and the mint. The coins of Henry I are split into 15 different types and categorised into BMC 1 to 15. The BMC stands for British Medieval Corpus, and there are also a handful of round struck half pennies too. Regardless of grade, this is the first Norman penny that will sit proudly in my collection, and I couldn't thank Fortuna Numismatics for his help in sourcing it for me. If you're wanting to buy any coins at competitive rates, be sure to check out his eBay store linked in the video description. So thank you everyone who continues to support the channel, and I'm working on something big that I will announce in the distant future when it all comes to a head. Next video will be on the Tilby coinage of Henry II, with some very handsome examples gracing the channel. So thank you all so much for watching, and as always, keep collecting!